All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I will just unmute. Um, I can unmute it actually. Um, your microphones. But I'm going to just unmute your mics uh, one by one so I can say good morning. Good morning, Demi. Good morning. Who is this? This is Roy. Roy, good morning. How are you? Great, thanks. Awesome. Lisa, good morning. Kimberly, good morning. Jennifer, good morning. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning, Demi. Did you get your coffee yet? I'm waiting for my coffee. <laughs> Are you getting it for me at Starbucks? Uh, I sorry, girl. I went already. <laughs> right. Nice. Yes. Andrea, good morning. Good morning, Demi. My goodness. This is like, what time is it for you guys? Asha, good morning. Good morning, Asha. And here. Graham, good morning. Good morning, Demi. How are you? Good morning, Jenny. Good morning, Jamie. All right. Good. Okay. So, um, first of all, um, let me um, just. Uh, okay, good. You guys are happy. All right. So here is what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do. I'm going to start with um, asking you if you have any questions from what we discussed yesterday. So, because uh, pretty much your mics are, are new, you can self-mute your mics from the point of view that um, to avoid background noise. Um, but um, if anyone has any question about what we discussed yesterday, either click on the feature raise hand or write a quick um, question or on, on, on the chat box, maybe an indication that yes, I have a question uh, or something like that. So um, this way I unmute your microphone, okay? This is where you write, right? Okay, good. So everybody will see it. So, uh, I'm going to go back real quick to uh, this. So this is the, the system that I'm using for the organizing board that I call it. It's called a real management system. Um, if anyone is interested on this, um, you guys can... Um, okay.
No, I'm getting into the wrong system. Alright, here we go. Alright, so um, as I was saying, um, we discussed yesterday Division 7, the executive division, that has the final valuable product, the viable expanding practice. We discussed Division 1, communications division, uh, that looks at the highly ethical, well trained, motivated staff who are in good communication and well organized. Um, we look at Division 2 um, that looks at expansion and also Division 6 that looks at marketing. Now, what I want to remind you about Division 2 and Division 6 is that Division 2 and Division 6 work hand in hand, they work together. Division 6 goes out there and markets to patients who come to your practice. It markets to doctors who send you diagnostic testing patients in your practice. And it markets to um, good. And it also markets to, uh, it markets to physicians for you to perform testing services in their offices. And that's, that's the purpose of Division 6. It markets to patients and physicians to come inside your primary facility or send patients in your, inside your primary facility for testing. And it markets to physicians, medical hospital organizations, and so on and so forth for you to go and do testing in their facility, outside business, okay? So that is what Division 6 is doing. And Division 2 then, and already, uh, and somebody that you already signed up, it establishes that practice um, and expands that practice. Whether it is your own practice, where it helps, Division 2 helps to establish the diagnostic testing inside your practice, or it helps to establish the diagnostic testing in other outside facilities, in outside businesses. So that is Division 2. So Division 6 is more of getting new people, doctors and patients. Division 2 is using your, our existing to establish them and further expand them. What do I mean further expand them? You have a patient who comes in your office, right? They got an EMG and a neuro ultrasound for their cervical spine, or, or yeah. And then, you know, during the process, you identify that the patient has a shoulder problem. Well, it is Division Two that gets to expand and add a joint musculoskeletal ultrasound for the shoulder. As you work out with a patient and you did an EMG. You are finding that the patient has bilateral abnormalities. They have a cervical radiculopathy with bilateral abnormalities. Well, it is division two, your expansion division, that will think, okay, good, that patient needs to get also an SSEP, somatosensory evoked potential to make sure that that patient does not have a myelopathy. Because if you do have bilateral symptomatology in the upper or lower extremities, where does this come from? Is it possible that, the, that a disc has, is compressing all the nerve roots? But if it is compressing both the nerve roots, is it possible that it moves um, uh, 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 posteriorly, and it compresses components of the cord causing myelopathy. Okay, so SSCP will show you that. You did the patient uh, with um, uh, uh, an EMG or a neuro ultrasound on a patient, and after the, during the examination, you identify that the patient, and you take the history and everything, that's also some symptoms of dizziness, maybe blurred vision, 
may be tinnitus. Well, that is then vision two that will expand the services to provide to that patient somatosensory evoked potentials. We look at central pathology causing the dizziness, um, the visual evoked potentials to look at the visual system at the cortical level and auditory brains and auditory evoked responses to see if there is anything, any central pathology, or we'll also do VNG, okay? Video nystomography, to look at vestibular dysfunction. So it is division two that will expand onto those services. But also division two will go to a physician's office that you already are doing testing, and you do maybe in that doctor's office only EMG and neuroultrasound. And you sit down and you discuss with the doctor that, hey, Mr. Uh, internal Medicine, or whatever specialty they have, don't you have patients who come who have weakness in the shoulder muscles, who have pain in the shoulder, arthritic knees, or pain in the knees, or complaints with their hip or with their elbows? We could be doing joint ultrasound those patients and you expand in that capacity, bringing into the office of that physician additional services. Listen, your therapists are being trained in everything. Just imagine then that you go to a physician's office and the physician might or might not have, let's say, enough patients to fill up completely your schedule on an eight-hour schedule. So imagine now that you have a physical therapist that, according to what we discussed yesterday, you pay them a good salary and you pay them a bonus. So if now the therapist is being trained properly and you have marketed additional services to that physician's office, then both the therapist and the physician can be motivated to produce additional services for patients. So if they have, for example, a patient who has bilateral symptomatology in their upper lower extremities, in the referral, you get that referral. I'm going to show that. In the referral, instead of them checking off only, let's say, EMG and neuro MSK because of numbness of the hands or numbness of the feet or this or that, or neck pain with radiculopathy. They can also check off a box potential studies because of the bilateral symptomatology. Numbness tingling in bilateral hands or feet. Rule out spinal stenosis, myelopathy. Okay, this is, they can check this off. All right, or the patient has some visual disturbance. So now your therapist who let's say that day for some reason they did not get the six or seven patients um, scheduled but they, that physician can only you know five patients or four patients scheduled if they put in a book potential studies that will feel that will provide first of all amazing information additional information for the patient but also it will um, Build the, the, the therapy schedule and it will provide additional revenue for the physician besides the patient benefit, additional revenue for the physician, additional revenue for you, and additional bonus for the physical therapist. So everybody wins. The patient wins, they have additional information. The physician can manage their patient better because they have additional information. And the therapist uh, and you can also uh, benefit both health
helping others and also making additional learning. All right, any questions? send you guys also an email this morning with all of the resources that we discussed yesterday. The only resource that I did not send you, I did not send you a copy of this uh, organizing board. And the reason I did not is because I don't know how to uh, convert this into PDF. So I am uh, Inquiring this from uh, Chuck Jacobs to actually uh, get me the ability to be able to uh, get you a picture of this. Okay. So, I, yeah. all right. Now, I am. If there are no other questions, I am going to move on to our point presentation. PowerPoint presentation and get into Division 3. So Division 3 is your finance division, right? And um, here is where you are going to do your bid. Let's look at the sequence of things. All right. First of all, those of you who are working and uh, in, in, in meeting regularly uh, in a weekly or bi weekly basis or every other week with uh, uh, your franchise service director, you know that. You can use him as a resource for doing questions. Um, also, every single person in the organization, in your organization, who has to do anything remotely with Lily, they should have taken or they should take the billing course. The billing course uh, is one of the uh, courses that. We offer it's called Hugs Billing Course, and uh, there's quite a few elements. It teaches you pretty much A to Z, very valuable information, and it gives you also a certificate at the end. So, whoever is doing your billing, even if they have not done the billing course, that is a problem. So, so that your franchise services director, who is also the real consultant, will help you establish the Google process. Uh, will help you navigate through the department system and advise you how to collect for any possible denials you may receive. There are times that some of the things that uh, uh, you may encounter might be very complicated. The rest assured that when there is a complicated issue, your being consultant does bring that up to my attention and I am consulting back and forth with him on how to solve this issue. Uh, you can always uh, send information to me too directly, but you know we prefer of course to keep the lines in your organization of work. So um, go first to your franchise service directly with these questions. Um, yeah. And the franchise service director and Bill consultant will help you to work with you on collecting all the required monthly reports from the practice to practice. Now listen, we want to make sure that every single claim is being paid. So here is what I'm going to tell you. The first important thing is that claims 
steps to go out for activity. And although you as an owner, you might think that the claims go out correctly, it is very possible that your billing person might not be sending out claims correctly. I have seen these guys time and time again, and please don't tell me that, hey, I do have a billing company and they'll do this right. Among you right now, there is uh, at least one or two practices, there are at least one or two practices where I personally witnessed that they were losing for a while a lot of money because that the billing people that they were paying a good percentage, they were sending out crap. They were not billing properly. For this reason, we have established a new policy. And our new policy is that when we bring someone on hats as a new franchisee and they start sending out bills, the first seven bills that they will send out to an insurance company before they mail it, before they send it out electronically, we want them to send us a copy of that HICFA form, even the electronic HICFA form. Because I'm telling you, they, people, are making mistakes. I have heard so many aberrated things, stupid things that they make absolutely no sense. I'm going to give you an example, guys. So here is an example of this. Okay, this is not old. This is fresh. This is yesterday. I'm receiving this from the Franchise Services Director. He says, I spoke to someone, one of our partners, who has a billing company that does their billing and said that he should not be billing 76881 for ultrasound because it pays apparently less money than code 76882. That is crap, excuse the expression. Oh my god, I forgot to record. Okay, good. Now I'm going to start recording. Sorry. Sorry, guys. One second. Oh, no. It's been recording automatically. Okay, I made him. So, all right, good. Sorry about that. So, this is wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. This is not correct. Okay, this is wrong. All of this is wrong. Okay, hey, some, for some reason, this billing company just got it wrong. They don't understand proper billing. Code 76881 pays substantially more than code 76882 because 76881 is defined as a complete ultrasound study, while 76882 is a partial, it's one structure, right? So here is what I'm telling you. If you go and you just take a single image of the median nerve and you don't take any other pictures at the risk, you're supposed to be the 76882 and get less money. But if you do, and not a single picture, but an investigation of the risk, where you include predominantly the median nerve into, into uh, labs and sacs, and then take a few images of the wrist, take four, six images at each wrist, then you can build 76881. Okay? You can build a higher reimbursable code this way. Okay? So, this code pays, I would say, uh, depending on the insurance, 
three to four times more than this code. Okay, so there's a big difference, not a small difference. All right. Of course, you know that uh, except of one um, regional intermediary on Medicare, who they pay for 76881 physical therapist, you know that the rest of the Medicare intermediaries, for now at least, they pay only 97750 instead of 76881. All right. Uh, also, since I am addressing the issue of being on musculoskeletal ultrasound, let me mention this. When you do billing for musculoskeletal ultrasound and you build right and left, okay, right side and left side, the correct way to build it is 9, is 7, 6, 8, 8, 1, one unit. Modifier RT for right and right underneath on a separate line item in your um, in your HICFA form or in your computer electronic form seven six eight eight one one unit modifier LT for left plus modifier 59. This way of building your uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound will provide you with the highest reimbursement uh, for musculoskeletal ultrasound. So you need to make sure that your um, billing person is using exactly this method to build for musculoskeletal ultrasound. If you are not certain that they are building it correctly, then have them print out some HIPAA forms and have them uh, uh, show it to you and you show it to your uh, building consultant, Jerry Gordon. For Medicare, unless you are in the intermediary of Medicare that pays for it, the Medicare intermediary in Wyoming pays them full price on 76881. Otherwise, everybody else has to build two, three units of 97750, depending on how long time they spend, because this is a all right. Okay. Uh, let me see. Somebody's asking me something. All right. Can you repeat which Medicare plans only pay for nine seven seven five zero instead of seven six eight eight one? Okay. All Medicare intermediaries. As far as we know, except the Medicare intermediary in the state of Wyoming, pay for 7750 and not for 76881. Okay? Uh, for you, Janine, specifically in New York State, I do know specifically that uh, you cannot build 76881. You're going to be denied by Medicare. Okay? This is only Medicare, not the rest. The rest of the insurance will be 76881. Okay? All right, so that is for that. Then Andrea is asking for 97750. Medicare has said a GP modifier needs to be put with this code. Is this okay in regards to same reimbursement? Yes, this is correct. So here, let me say, for this, no GP modifier is needed, while when you build Medicare, 
you're going to bill it like this 97750 two units for example modifier GP all right for 97750 you must include modifier GP all right for 76881 whenever you bill it uh, no GP modifier is All right. Now, since I talked about GP modifier, let me give you also another horrible mistake that has been done. Are there any other questions on muscular step of ultrasound here? Okay. I see no questions. If you have a question, just type it. Okay? But here is what I'm going to tell you now about EMG. Here is a big mistake. As you know, EMG will feel the nerve conduction study part first. And then we build the needle part. For the nerve conduction part, we build both, let's say, 95. 913 or 912 or 911 depending on how many nerves you did let's say if you did 13 nerves or more you have to build 95913 if you build for 11 or 12 nerves you're going to build 95912 Okay, so 95913 is for 13 or more nerves. So it's equal or greater than 13 nerves. 95912 is for 11, 12 nerves. 95911 is for 9 to 10 nerves. 9, 5, 9, 1, 10 is for 8 to 9 nerves. And 9, 5, 9, 1, 9 is for 6 to 7 nerves. I don't think even in a unilateral study that you can do anything less than uh, six nerves. So, so then the way you're supposed to build it is you're supposed to build, let's say you did 12 nerves, right? You did 12 nerves or 11 nerves, you're going to build 9, 5, 9, 1, 2. One unit. That's it. I have seen sometimes practices to put the modifier GP next to it. That's a mistake. Do not put modifier GP in any EMG building. Okay? It's a mistake. Do not do that. Okay? Good. Then for the needle EMG, you are going to build either 95886. And if you did only one arm, you're going to do one unit. If you did two arms, you're going to do two units. Okay? 95886 requires for you to do five muscles, including the paraspinals, okay, or at least one of the paraspinals. If you do less than um, five muscles, if you do only two muscles, then the code that you have to build is 95885. Not nine nine five eight eight six. 
So let me give you an example. You do on the right side five muscles, you do on the left two muscles, you're going to feel one unit of nine, five, eight, six, and you're going to feel one unit of nine, five, eight, eight, five. Okay? So this is how you go about your here to do. Any questions on this? So, you do then the proper coding, you do the proper building, you obtain all the proper demographics on the proper forms, and all of these now um, is sent out to the insurance companies. Good. So the insurance companies are supposed to send the payment and the billing department is supposed to post that payment and if there is a reason for an appeal, you got to follow an appeals process. So, in the uh, fiscal shock training that I have here for you, I'm giving you a 44-minute video that is specific to the appeals process. I have all of the appeals sample letters for you, and I have the appeals spreadsheet for you. The spreadsheet is something very important. If you as an owner, this is one of the documents you have to be looking at. Why is that? First of all, the appeal spreadsheet, I made it so easy for you. Not only I gave you a whole um, video training on how to do the appeals process. Okay? Voice there, but I gave you a whole training there on how to go through the whole appeals process, okay? But the spreadsheet that I gave you, this, has five tabs. The final tab, the fifth tab, gives you precise instructions what to do under each column, and it outlines all the steps. So what you want to do is this. You want to have when a denial is being received, and you want the billing person to enter here the patient's name, then after they enter the patient's name, you want them to enter the date that the bill was sent. And the amount that was denied. And here is what you want. You absolutely want to have you absolutely want to have the date that the denial was received. Now here is why. When you enter the day that you received the denial, if the day that the bill was sent, from the day that the insurance company produced the denial, if that time is greater than 45 days, and let me clarify the date that they received it from the day, the day that they received the bill, from the date that they produced the denial. If more than 45 days lapsed, the insurance company is obligated to pay you automatically because they only have 45 days 
to actually um, hold uh, the, the claim without being in one quick second. We're going to jump real quick to say what I showed before here, guys, just for clarification was only for straight Medicare. Uh, I'm sorry, this is for all Medicare. This is for all Medicare. Even if it is straight Medicare or Medicare HMOs or Medicare Advantage. This is for all Medicare. Now, if you are not board certified and you are billing straight Medicare, only straight Medicare, not Medicare Advantage, not Medicare HMO, only straight Medicare, you should bill 25 FTC for the technical component, and you will have some good chances for most intermediaries to reimburse you. Um, they'll reimburse only a percentage, they won't reimburse the whole thing, but they should be able to reimburse you until you get your board certification. And that's the idea. Get your board certification as quickly as possible. That's why we want you to do a lot of studies in your um, in your uh, uh, residency program so you guys can get board certified very fast. All right, then your billing department sends out Appeal number one. So that is an appeal letter that says, hey, why didn't you pay us? We are supposed to be doing this testing. Please pay us. There might be a different case there. Actually, let me finish this first and then I'll tell you a different case. You wait for the response. Um, send appeal number two if they do not pay you if they pay you that's fantastic if they don't pay you after the first appeal you send a second appeal and that second appeal you also submit it to your state insurance department with a complaint to them all right now after the second level of appeal finishes, if the insurance company paid, at that point they should pay, but if they are insisting and they are not paying, then you have to make a decision either to write it off or go legal. In legal, at the first level of legal, all it requires is a letter from your attorney to the insurance company telling them that you can involve an attorney in the process. Sometimes just by doing that, they will pay. If you have a negative outcome, then here is you do. You go to an administrative judge, okay, uh, and you do litigation with the administrative judge, okay? And that is your final uh, recourse. I would have to tell you that just recently in New York, we had a major, major, major win with one of the very large insurance companies called Intellis. We had a major win with them, and uh, the win happened right here when the state insurance department was involved. We didn't have to go to that other step. But when the state insurance department um, got involved, um, really, they, um, all of the reasons that they had before for not paying just uh, disappeared. And uh, well, they are actually reprocessing us, our claims now, uh, for over a year uh, of duration. I'm expecting a very, very fast check from them. 
Okay, good. So, um, now there might be, I do the same thing for ultras, for EMG, ultrasound, the both potentials and DNGs. So, I need you guys, you as owners, to be on top of it. Uh, I need you to really be looking at this in a monthly basis. This should be one of the documents that you are reviewing in a monthly basis. Now, um, there are a few different reasons why an insurance company might deny pay. It may not be that they don't pay you all the time because um, they say that this is out of your scope. They might say, it is part of your scope, that's fine, we have no problem, we'll pay you. But we will pay you a lower rate. That's a great mistake. We get a special letter. It is part of all the letters, and if you can't find it, speak to Jerry. We get it for you. We get it for you. It's a special letter that says that they don't have the right to discriminate and pay you less than they pay another provider. Okay, and, and that's a fact. Um, Good. Now, here is the thing. There is another possibility. They might deny you because they say that you have a contract with them and the contract you have with them stipulates a payment of $40 or $50 for PP. So, they may pay you just the $50. You do an EMG, they pay you the $50. Or they may not pay you at all because they say, my contract with you is only for PP. It's not for anything else. All right? So here is what happens. We have a letter. Which letter has worked, I will tell you, more than 50% of the time. It's not all proof, okay? It doesn't work 100% of the time, but 50% of the time that letter works. I want you to follow the logic of it, right? So, you tell the insurance that you are telling us that you are. Hold on. Tell the insurance company this. You are either paying us a reduced fee or no, no, or no payment or a flat payment or no payment. And you say that because you say that we have an agreement with you, a contract. So here is how we argue that. First of all, let's establish something. We are establishing that we are able in the state, in our state, in your state, we are able, based on our practice act and everything, to do EMGs. So we establish with them that, okay? So nobody disagrees with that. It's part of our practice act. Now, here's the thing. You paid us less, or you didn't pay us at all. So if you paid us less, or if you have not paid us at all, please make sure that you understand that if you end up paying us, you have to pay us in a non-discriminatory fashion, and you have to pay us what you pay another provider who is providing the same service. Okay? 
So you shall not discriminate with respect to participation under the plan or coverage against any healthcare provider who is acting within the scope of that provider's license or certification under applicable law. Okay? Now, the law says that if you pay us less, the only reason you, have to pay, you can pay us less if you prove as an insurance carrier that our quality or performance measures are substandard compared to another provider that you pay them more. Please also understand that this federal law is the law of the country and that federal mandate supersedes not only any state law but it also supersedes individual agreements between you as an insurance carrier and me as a provider regardless of any individual agreements that you as an insurance company and me as a provider might have, the federal law prevails. So the procedure that I build is a procedure performed by a physical therapist, but it does not constitute a regular physical therapy visit. And therefore, it should not be paid as a flat rate, but rather as a diagnostic testing visit with specific CPT codes that must be paid individually and separately from the physical therapy codes. Okay? So furthermore, we're asking you to review once again the built codes and pay them at a regular fee schedule, same as you would get paid any other provider performing the same service as indicated in the aforementioned legislation, this one here. Okay? Then we're talking about CMS. This, oh, please know that the only time, the only time you may vary reimbursement for a service provided is if you may identify a difference on quality or measures or performance measures of what we provide versus what other providers provide. You see, they have to prove that we provide less of quality to pay less. Otherwise, they cannot pay less. We're asking you to expedite an update of the hospital's profile, your profile, and reimburse them for these studies. We further ask you to reverse your flat rate or low reimbursement and pay immediately for this claim. Failure to do this will force us to go to the next level of appeal or seek legal protection. Okay? So this is a powerful letter. Um, I don't know if you guys know, um, is it MediBlue? It's an empire, it's a Blue Cross uh, uh, program, MediBlue, I think it's called. Uh, and they were paying us a flat fee, and we managed to get it reversed. Uh, we succeeded on that. Bart McDonald from uh, um, Idaho succeeded on that, and we got a whole bunch of back payments. And one more person. And we have at least three examples within has that they succeed on this very letter. So that's how I am addressing this item. So, any other questions that you may get about general handlings in terms of appealing the insurance carrier? Any other questions? Thank you. Good. 
All right. So now, here is the thing. You had your feeling, or you did not get your opinion in the right way. Generally speaking, I will tell you that if you take, if you have a hundred, and you have whatever number of insurance, let's say you have 30 different plans, and you do a hundred tests, and you build for a hundred tests, what I have observed is that you should get paid 70% of your claims with the first pass, meaning with the first submission. You're going to have initially 30% of the claims that will not get paid, and you will need to fight the budget for with either submitting your certificates or uh, uh, completing the courses, or you might need to submit some of the approved letters. In everything in life, consistency is what wins. When you do not give up. My friends, our system is the way it is complicated by design. And, and, and I want you to understand this. Look what happens. If the law was followed exactly as it is meant to be, there would be no problem whatsoever for you to get paid like 99% of the time. But the law is not being followed as it meant to be, but we have to enforce it. So what happens is these insurance companies have created a very complicated bureaucratic system to bring you into apathy and to give up. So when you send a bill and you have to try again and again and again and again and it doesn't work, you give up. You go into apathy and you say, ah, the heck with it, whether I see 500 bucks, I don't care for the 500 bucks. But listen to what happens. So, when you give up, for that $500, you give up for the next $500 bill, and the next $500 bill, and the next $500 bill, you see. But if you succeed with one insurance carrier who gives you a problem for one $500 bill that it took you lots of hours of handling, then they change your profile, okay, in their system, and then they keep reimbursing for all the subsequent five hundred dollar bill. You follow me? You only have to win them one time. Once you win them one time, you get a precedence about it and they update your profile in their system. So if you have a denial from an insurance company that you may say, hey, it doesn't matter, it's just five hundred dollars. That you, this is a disservice to you and your practice, and actually, it is a disservice to the entire physical therapy community and to us that we are trying to really create a system that the physical therapist will be fully recognized performing all of these things. Okay, so please, 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 when we have. Even one denial, don't give up. Work with us, fight it, do appeals, and win every single bill, every single invoice. Even if this means through our appeals program that you might have to get the first, second, or then third level of appeal. Okay? Even if it requires that extra legwork, it is worthwhile in the long run for you to find it with 17 years. Alright. Any questions on this by anyone?
All right, good. So now, once you appeal, you receive the money and everything, whatever you did, it is your obligation to report things. So, you are supposed to be going in a, in a monthly basis to this system Objective management suite, and you are supposed to be reporting this uh, monthly. At the beginning of every month, you are to be reporting the statistics about the previous month. And listen, um, I understand you might say, Oh, do I really have to do it? Yes, you have to do it. This is not an option, this is a requirement that we put in front of you. Okay? We really need to have your data. Having your data, we can manage better and we can help you better. Okay? Having your data, we put them in our database and there is a special function in our part of Objective Management Suite. We don't have exactly the same thing that you have. We have like kind of a super OMS, and that super OMS gives us cumulative access to all data of all franchises around the country, and then we can take your data and we can compare them against the sum of data, and we can give you some good suggestions. It's like doing a KPI study, right? We are able to provide you with measurements and data on how you compare against everybody else. So we don't when we don't get compliance from one practice on this, that screws up the rest of the practices. So uh, we need compliance on this. We need everybody to be filling out their OMS at the beginning of every month. And I have to tell you that those of you who, who may not have uh, been uh, consistently putting their data, even if the data is zero, um, you're going to be hearing from me personally. So, uh, you know, some of you wait your phone to be ringing with me on the other side, and I'm going to keep you on the phone as long as it will take me to finish, like, call, like, I'll get, not a grand day, I'll get a venti uh, opportunity, all right? So let me see next. All right, this is the use of our mess. Um, and one thing that I must repeat for no mess, and, and this is very important is the following. Let me just show you this. OMS gives you the weekly module and the monthly module. And you have in-house and outside. For the in-house, okay, your monthly module is the module that you use to manage the core practice and helps us to help you manage the diagnostic practice. The weekly module is what you use to manage your diagnostician, the statistics of your diagnostician, your staff members. So, definition of in-house is all billing done by you, regardless if it's done inside your office or in a satellite location that you rent from a physician. Definition of outside, physician does the billing, and you just provide the service. And I showed you yesterday uh, how to use FreshBooks to send them a bill. So, um, 
you use, you have your staff to input all of the statistics, whether it is outside or inside or in house, into the in house weekly module. Because you don't care if that EMG, if the number of EMGs or number of ultrasounds that the specific therapy is producing, if they are from outside business or in house business. Okay? That you don't care. All you care is for them to be productive. So for internal use purposes, you can use the in-house weekly module for them to put the weekly individual statistics for regardless if it is in-house or outside business. But when you use the monthly module for you to track your income, your expenses, your profitability, margin, use separately in-house and outside uh, business. Okay. Good. Now, you get to then collect money, manage your stuff properly, and produce. I'm talking about division three now, right? Finance division, and you produce higher incomes. All right, so then you should be looking at further expansion and moving from business owner to investor. So, should you put then all of your money into investment? Should you put all of your money into business expansion? In my opinion, you should do both. You should take a portion of your money and put it in investments so you have the money to work for you, meaning you can have your own um, financial advisor who can help you get your investments uh, straightened out uh, and or started. Uh, you can speak. Uh, we brought uh, uh, last year, if you remember, at the symposium, Christopher Music. Uh, he has some very, very innovative ideas. Actually, several uh, of the HUDS partners and myself, we were in the Millionaires Club uh, of uh, Christopher Music uh, down in Florida just a few weeks ago. We had a blast. Very, very amazing. So I think it's a really very good way to do things and, and help how to invest uh, your money, but also you want to take a portion of that money and expand further. How to expand further? You can go and expand into a different territory, um, buy another territory and expand into another territory, identify in another area someone who you get into a partnership with him and buy a territory and, and you develop uh, a practice there. Do what uh, uh, Will and Nathan did, where they did their due diligence and, and, and they do a very good research around the country and they found that Alaska had the highest reimbursement. Nathan moved to Alaska and he has developed at this point an extremely, extremely profitable uh, business right there, uh, making very, very good revenues. Uh, so there are many ways to go about it. So part of your money, you decide to invest it in the business, in the business expansion. Part of the money, uh, you invest uh, uh, into other businesses uh, through an investment plan. So that is these are my suggestions on the area for uh, the area for division three. Any questions on what I just said? Anything else on that? Let me know. Okay, so I'm going to move now to discuss a little bit division four. Division four is your clinical division. 
Right. You should have your clinical division, a clinical director, a clinical manager, somebody who is really managing that area. Usually that person will be probably the first person to get involved in the business with you on this. Initially, if you are uh, in the very initial stages of the business, you may want to run it from above. So if you as a CEO, you may run the clinical division. Or if you get a few staff that you can train now, you can get a clinical director who is running this division. So the job of the clinical director is any director, any director job. The job here, of any person of here, is production. They, you want them to get high production. So you get somebody in charge of clinical, and you want to make sure on clinical that people are uh, doing. They are educated, they are doing their testing, they are doing proper testing, and uh, that the whole process runs as a well-oiled machine. Uh, patients from the clinic are being referred to the diagnostic clinicians, patients from the doctors are being referred to the diagnostic clinicians, and the testing is performed, it's performed in time, um, Reports are being reviewed by the mentor uh, in a timely fashion. Give the reports out to the, uh, the physicians or the patients and, and the therapists, and we manage those patients properly based on the proper diagnostic data. This is what we need to see happening. Yesterday, I present to you in detail the seven steps for a successful EMG um, or uh, MSK address. And I insist that that is a very important, um, very important process, a very important document that you guys have to keep in mind and you have to, um, and you have to apply. So a few items that I would like to address here, because I see them uh, not happening uh, appropriately, and also uh, resolving some uh, questions that you might have. Yeah, are the following. Number one, I am strongly, strongly suggesting that you take advantage of the technologies, certified technologies program we are starting on March 29, 30th, and 31st. That program will take place exactly the same weekend as our regular stage one. Identify from your practice the proper technologies, the proper aid, or a PTA, and send them for training. They are going to learn how to do the nerve production study, they're going to learn how to do neuro ultrasound, and they will be a great help to the physical therapist for production purposes. Okay. What I must remind you though is that when the technician does the study, that study, meaning the nerve production study, that does not count towards the 295 studies that you must get on the residency program. But for production purposes, it's great. But if you are trying to get the 295, you won't count towards that. You know, if you are working towards your 295, get a combination. Work for your 295 and put additional studies above and beyond that to be produced by, with the help of the of the aid, the technician, uh, your health there. They'll be able to get to a lot more productivity in the same period of time. Now, I want to address this about your systems. 
you get the time well, EMG, and you get a sonocyte ultrasound. Your sonocyte ultrasound is a five-year service contract. Anything that happens to it for the next five years, you are covered. You have no problem with that. However, if your EMG machine uh, is um, older than a year from the moment you purchased it, well, that is out of uh, contract. And just a stimulator or an amplifier, if it breaks, it's a few thousand dollars. So, hear me out. This is my suggestion. This is what we do. On an annual basis, obtain from Cadwell a, a level three service. Why not a level two? Why not a level four? Okay? Why am I saying a level three? Okay, I'm not saying a level two. Two, because a level two will not cover free shipping back and forth for your annual machine calibration. Okay? So it doesn't cover everything. That's why not a level two. Why not a level four? Because you pay a gazillion of dollars more for a level four, for a level four, to cover the laptop computer. No, nothing additional is covered from level four, but just the computer. Well, a laptop computer, you can go and spend 200 bucks if it breaks, and you can buy any laptop computer compatible to the system. Okay, a simple Dell computer is, is, is fine for the system. So you don't need to spend all the money for a level four, but you need a level three. Why a level three? Here is what happens to level three. Number one, it will cover everything about the machine. Amplifiers, stimulators, the machine itself, channels, peripherals, everything, except for the laptop. And it will cover them for full free replacement and overnight shipping to you. So, zero production value, okay? If something happens to the machine, Cadwell will fix the machine for free with a level three service. They will cover Federal Express shipping back and forth for the machine. They will cover a replacement identical machine and the shipping back and forth for that machine, okay? Once a year, you need your calibration. They will cover your annual calibration. They will cover the shipping back and forth for your annual calibration. So they cover pretty much everything with a level three service. And that's why I strongly suggest that every year you do get a level three service and calibrate your machine annually. Okay, so. Just remember my words. Make sure that you calibrate your machines annually. Your cost, I think it's about around eighteen hundred dollars. You see, the cost depends on when you bought your first machine, and then there is like every year a little increase or something. So, just about eighteen hundred ninety. Or so. You know how many of these I pay every year? <laughs> yeah. I get like nine machines. I pay nine annual contracts. Okay? It's, it's almost, almost like buying a brand new machine every year. Anyway. Um, okay, that's about the capital annual contract. Now, how to select proper nervous muscles 
to use based on AA and NEF guidelines and how to maximize your dealing with ethical and legal AA and NEF and medical guidelines for testing. All right, look. In here, Under franchise owners' books, I have this lecture entitled How Many Nerve Muscles Do You Have? How Many Nerves Do You Have? So I am giving you an actual handout on how many nerves and muscles to do. I am giving you a table from AANEN. But I'm also I'm giving you common reports. Here is what happens. And I want you as owners especially to appreciate that. What I observe is that when a staff member does not have enough confidence about their testing because they are reluctant, they are doing less testing. They are under testing. Okay. If I have a patient who has the carpal tunnel syndrome, okay, even on one hand, okay, even unilateral, you see that? Even unilateral, there is a reason why they will allow you, AA and EM will allow you seven nerves, three motors, and four sensors for a unilateral carpal tunnel syndrome on one hand. There is a reason they do that. It is not arbitrary. Plus, you are allowed to deviate by 10%, all right, also from this. But look at this. If a patient is symptomatic for numbness and tingling, and you do a sensory median nerve, and let's say a sensory ulnar nerve, and you find them normal. You just can't stop at that, at that and say, I'm done with my sensory studies. That's a crime. That's malpractice. The patient is freaking symptomatic. <laughs> this means if the patient is symptomatic, there is some reason for the symptomatology. If you are not finding what's wrong with them, you're not doing enough testing. You need, in that case, to do more nerves, more techniques to identify what is going on with that. So look at this. Therapists will do less studying, less nerves, if they are not confident about their technique. They'll be uncertain. So what am I doing in this presentation here, in the video presentation here, which is only 20 minutes? 29 minutes long, I am analyzing in much more detail the specific, the specific uh, pitfalls that lead someone to do less number of studies. So, for example, For example, patient is 
is in the room and the physical therapist is asking them, oh, what brings you in today? And the patient says, yeah, I have um, numbness and tingling in my right hand. Okay, yeah, uh, when do you feel it? At night, and da da da, which fingers? Okay, good. We're going to do a test now to examine your right hand. Did you ever ask the patient if the patient has any symptoms on the left hand? Did you ever ask the patient if the patient has any symptoms in their feet? The patient, if this is their predominant symptom, they will forget to mention to you any other symptom. If you go to a doctor because you have an intense cough and you can't breathe, that is what you have in your mind at that point. You are going to tell them about your intense cough. You are not going to tell them about your occasional itch around the ribcage, around the waist, or the slight redness in that area until a couple of months later herpes zoster breaks out big time, shingles break out big time. But hey, you did not mention it because the primary symptom was the cough. Meanwhile, if you mentioned it at that time, what would have happened was the doctor could have put you on antivirals and protect the exacerbation of symptoms from shingles. Or maybe it might even have been at a period of time where the vaccine might have been able to be given to you. So when a patient comes in, they tell you, yes, I have numbness on my right hand. And you omit to ask them if they have any numbness on the left hand or anywhere else, you're essentially doing mock practice. If you don't ask them, I understand if you ask them and they tell you no, but if you don't ask them, you're committing mock practice. You know why? Because can they mention to you that they have mild symptoms on the other hand? If you had asked them, you would have tested the contralateral side and you would have found that the patient has a mild carpentanial syndrome and you could save him from surgery if you did at that time physical therapy in the contralateral side. This is very important and the staff need to understand it. And yes, to some degree, the courses, stage one, two, three, and four, cover that. But when somebody has this information as part of a wider spectrum of information, they many times neglect to pay attention to it. Their level of awareness is such about the importance of this to just make sure that they pay attention to it and they miss it. That's why I created this presentation, which is like 29 minutes long, that you give to all of your patients, to all of your therapists, so to make sure that they are not missing anything. Okay. So, and I have here articles and, and, and other things about, uh, about what is appropriate. So that is an important thing I want to mention. I want to talk to you about automation with the Cadwell system. Okay, so each one of your mentors will work with you differently, meaning to some degree, right? Some mentors will allow you to do more automation, some mentors will allow you to do less automation with your Cadwell system. Um, in other words, when I'm saying automation, in your machine, we have installed a preserve, right? You know how to find your preserve. So if I go here to Dropbox, let me go to Dropbox real quick. I'll go to this Dropbox. When I go to
So, I'm going to go here, for example, to Mindy's Dropbox. So, go to your go inside your Dropbox, and I have installed this folder that is called generic data. If you open the generic data folder, I have a whole bunch of information for you, but also a folder that is called preserves and equipment info. So under preserves, this is your preserve. This is the latest preserve available to you. This is what you installed in your machine. So this preserve, it gives you normative values, but it also gives you information about um, statements, words that you can automate your report and you can make it faster. Some method will allow you to use all of the measures. Some method will allow you to use part of the information. So, so here is what the position of has about automation. Automation should be there and automate reports should be there to help you be productive faster. But I'm sorry about the expression, automation is not there to make you stupid. Okay? In other words, automation is not there for you to use it because you don't know how to do a report or to look at the data. That's not the purpose of automation. Automation is not to keep you in a zone of ignorance, in a zone of not knowingness, the material. That's not the purpose of automation. Information is something that you know how to put it together, how to write it, what the meaning of it is. You use automation to make it faster, easier, with higher production. That's it. And to make sure that you're not missing any details, which have some legal written sentences in that report, for example. We have some legality sentences incorporated in this report make sure that you are covered from the law. And so um, that is how and when you use automation to generate reports. Okay? And uh, back here again. I have for you into the owner's course EMG report writing with Hardwell software. Okay? I have an hour long video for you on how to write reports using the Hardwell software. Okay? Please make sure that you watch all these. Any questions? So far. Can I start to access that video? Um, well, your staff your staff uh, can access that video on the old module one. All right. That is a good observation. We can create module with videos for staff. Okay. You are going to receive a communication that will include um, a series of videos that your staff, I'll look at this, I said the word series and series 
just the things that I'm talking to here. No serious, no problem. All right. Um, I will create a, 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 a course that will make it available to your staff um, so that everybody can have available this information in their hands. Um, all this information that I'm giving you uh, is available in the old module one course that we have online. So anybody who has access to the old module one has access to this. But the people who joined the organization more recently, where they put Canvas for stage one, two, three, and four, they don't have the old module one, and therefore some of this information is missing. So I will make sure to create a separate course, and we're going to be putting everybody on that, and we'll get this information ready. Okay? All right. Um, division five is your quality assurance division. Division five is, is very important because you have to make sure that uh, everything that is happening within your diagnostic organization, organization is checks out. Um, on uh, Division 5, there is a document I'm going to show you. I emailed it to you this morning. Uh, it's part of the documents that I emailed to you. But uh, I'm going to show you this document again. Patient satisfaction questionnaire. In a scale from 0 to 10, this is after your test and given to the patient. In a scale from 0 to 10, please rate your overall level of satisfaction with today's nerve testing. Circle 1 will apply. In a scale from 0 to 10, please rate your overall level of satisfaction with the professionalism of the associate who performed your nerve test today. Based on today's experience with us, would you recommend a friend or family member to see us for testing? Okay, so um, this is basically out of all of the four questions that I have listed here, this is the most important question. This is the equivalent of your net promoter score, okay? So when a patient says yes, they would recommend a friend or a family member to see us for testing. Um, that is gold. This is what you want. Even if someone rates you a 5 or a 6 here, or a 5 or a 6 here, but they say yes to this, this means that they are willing to overlook anything else, any lack of pleasure or any dissatisfaction that they may have had with the testing and that they would send you something to friend or whatever. Okay, so this is important. Of course, what we do here, um, once the patient says yes here, then um, we advise you to specifically ask the patient, say, hey, you put in your uh, patient satisfaction questionnaire that uh, you would recommend a friend or a family member to see us for testing. Who do you have in mind? And ask the patient to ask you who they have in mind. And if they can give you a name and a number, you call that person on in behalf of that on behalf of that patient, and you talk to them and you make an appointment to see them for the free screening that leads to both PT and uh, diagnostic testing. All right, so you use then a quality control survey, a division five uh, 
Division 5 tool as a Division 6 marketing um, uh, result. Okay. Right, and of course, you ask them that if there is something that they could do to um, their uh, research. Now, in terms of um, sure also that you do um, twice a year uh, evaluations, staff evaluations, um, and uh, that includes a career advancement um, discussion and agreement. Um, I showed you yesterday uh, higher votes. Um, I would suggest that you do from higher votes the program um, for your own staff, your existing staff, the assessment of your existing staff once a year. Uh, and then six months from that, we just review any goals that were agreed in terms of uh, improvement. Um, so uh, that is what I would uh, recommend there. Uh, but also, in terms of the application of the program, uh, by you looking at uh, the patient uh, assessment questionnaires and correlating it with how many referrals were made for the diagnostic testing, uh, that gives you an opportunity for a kind of a instant uh, interaction and quality improvement of the therapist right on the job there. They may not be referring because they may not be understanding something. So that's part of the quality improvement and part of the understanding of the career development of the therapist, enhancing their understanding in terms of which patients would be uh, appropriate to be uh, referred for testing. Um, I would like to ask you guys at this point to ask me any general questions that you might have about anything that I can tell general questions about anything that I can tell Okay. Um, I don't see any general questions. So what I am going to ask at this point is the following. If you are a staff member who works for a practice and you are on the call right now, I will say goodbye to you and uh, um, I want to mention that I finished uh, all of the materials that were um, available today for non-owners. So if you are in the call and you are not an owner, um, you, I'm saying goodbye to you and, and you can have uh, the rest of your uh, Friday, the rest of your Sunday to enjoy. Uh, if you are a private practice owner, still on the Good. So I think that we have at this point yes.
पड़ जाए Okay, good. Right now we are only owners on the call. I'm gonna unmute you guys. Hi Jenny. Hi Lisa. Hi Mindy. Hi Roy. Hi. <laughs> Alright, so I can anybody that I could um, okay. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Jamie. So, um, I don't think that's anybody. Hi, Jamie. So, at this point, I want to let you know that pretty much I have. Uh, uh, finished a uh, uh, for uh, the presentation today. So um, you can ask me, as owner, now any questions you have much about anything, anything whatsoever that you have a question about. Um, you can ask me. We spoke about yesterday today. It's Cindy. I, um, <laughs> I have a question. While you were uh, looking for something, I went through your handouts that you emailed us. And I was thinking that having a meeting on full staff meeting on Tuesday, and I really want to represent this. I feel like every time we present it, the number of patients schedule goes up. But I have to be able to present it to the front desk staff as well as the PTs. A lot of times when I'm presenting things I'm excited about, they sit there like the tone is so just so long. And it's, I feel like I love to lecture, but to my staff is the worst audience I have. And I almost feel like when you're talking about um, that they don't understand or they think that you're in it trying to get money. You know, it's that whole kind of, we're here to do PT. And the ones who do the testing or had just taken a class are very motivated about it. And those are the ones that will refer, but the other ones sit there with a blank stare. And it's not just about diagnostics. It could be anything I'm presenting. And uh, it's funny because if I present to them and I present that same lecture to outside people, it's like I'm presenting in a comedy club outside of my office and I go there and it's just a joy kill. Um, it's almost like, what now? Like, um, so I thought to myself, well, maybe it is about the misunderstanding. So I was reading through some of the things that you had there for the doctors. You sent us a combination where we, we scroll down, it has everything on it. Um, and at the bottom, you had articles. And I feel that maybe if I give these PTs articles to read prior to the meeting, that they'll have a better understanding. Because in the meeting, they're just sitting there. If a squirrel is outside and the shades are open, I already lost their attention. And 
Not that I'm not guilty of that as well. There's just so much going on, but they're not listening. And if they're not listening, it's probably a bunch of misunderstoods. I understand the yawning that goes on. And so I'm trying to somehow make it ABC to them. And I feel like we've given this lecture, we've been with you, what, four years at least? And uh, again, it, it's a roller coaster of, of when they do it. It depends on who's involved. And that therapist understands or went to something, they're the ones whose patients come in. And then it gets forgotten about. And I'm just trying to do something that gets their attention in an ABC trying to, you know, way that it's not so high ingredient. They have no idea what the heck is going on. Okay. So let me address this from two different points. Okay. So here is the answer that you do not expect from me. You have to see the issue from the foundation and truly the foundation of many of these problems is that many practices, say the majority of the practices of the diagnostic practice, you do not have separate organizing separate company with its own policies and procedures. So I would say that the fundamental that we get create this separate company, create the separate separate statistics, the separate policies and procedures for this company. Right. Um maybe if you cannot hear me, uh, I don't know what can everybody else hear me okay? Just try to get you to hear me right now. Actually, see if you can hear me. Can it just hear sounds me. pretty distant. Sounds quiet. Since you muted us, unmuted us. Since you unmuted, there's a lot of interference. If you unmute us, I think it will be better. So here is what you do. I don't want to mute you. Everybody go ahead and mute yourselves. And then unmute yourselves when you want to talk. Okay, do that. Okay, perfect. Thank you, guys. All right, so probably now you can hear me better. So what I'm saying is it is very important that you guys go ahead and create a separate organization on board and a separate separate um, entity with its own uh, policies and procedures with staff that they report statistics and they are looking after this company. You see, what happens is if you have your PD company and within your PD company a little component of diagnostics, they do diagnostics the same way as if you brought laser in the practice or it's as if you brought women's health or as if you brought a massage service or, it, or, or as if you brought vitamins. They view it as a little additional niche. And this is not what it's supposed to be. This is supposed to be a totally brand new, separate business that runs in parallel with your physical therapy business. There is nothing wrong to have a staff member to be, to have a play a role in one company and play a role in and play a role in the other company also, but when they play a role in the other company, they should be able uh, to um, report statistics, follow policies and procedures, have separate meetings with that company. For example, we have meetings with the staff and general staff meeting with with uh, uh, hands on physical therapy, but we have separate weekly meetings, separate staff, separate organizing board for hands on EMG. Even if it is small, as long as you can have Two people in that company, in your diagnostic company, it should be a separate company with its separate rules, regulations, statistics, and this and that. Now that, as a separate company with the players of that company, can represent and talk to your physical therapy company. Now, how do you get staff acting? You see. This is not a, 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 a simple answer thing. 
uh, this can include a lot of different components and a lot of different things you have to do, and we can help each other on that. How? Number one, um, by bringing up a topic about diagnostics in each and every meeting. Give each and every one of you who are in this call, I have right now nine owners, nine individual owners in that call, in this call right now. With the people we had yesterday, we had participating in this program, in this group, just about uh, 12 distinct and separate practices. If each and every one of you reports once a week in the hands group email a positive thing about the patient, we're going to get so many positive testimonials that you then can go in your meeting and you can read some of these testimonials to the staff. Now just imagine, Cindy, that in your practice you had a patient where your staff did something and had a positive outcome on diagnostics. Have that staff member share that in the meeting. And actually, now that you posted it in the, in, in, in the email, Janine in her weekly meeting and Nindi in her weekly meeting, she can take that testimonial from you, Cindy, that you posted it online in uh, uh, the HUD groups, and she can read that testimonial in her meeting, and that can cultivate a little conversation there. And guess what? If the group of all the owners of cats start seeing in a consistent basis some testimonials being generated by you guys, guess what they are going to do? They are going to follow suit. They are going to start posting their own testimonials too. And we are going to have people reporting testimonials and then you can share these testimonials in the middle. These are true patient stories. In some cases, some of you, you might be able to post a video, too, about that. So those testimonials can help the staff members start realizing uh, that there is more in the diagnostics than just money. Okay. And of course, a very important point is for them to start seeing a clinical significance. If you do a test on a patient, and you say the patient has a C6 lobotomy on the right, and you keep that information, and you do not go to that physical therapist and say, hey, you are manipulating that patient's spine. Well, you don't have to do any longer just general manipulation of the cervical spine. Do techniques that will aim to release the right C6 nerve root. You need to do transfers, transfers glides from the left to the right, for example, to try to disengage the right C6 root. You can be specific with that, you know. We found that this patient has not only cervical neuropathy, but a mild carpal tunnel. To have better results, not only you should do the manipulative technique in the cervical spine, you should go ahead and do um, a technique of uh, neuromobilization at the risk. Okay? Correlating a lot the diagnostics with clinical practice. Follow me. That, that would be key. Uh, and the more of that you do, the better it's going to be. Any comments on that, Cindy? Yeah, I was just I was just typing. <laughs> I was going to send it to you. I wrote that I really feel now that I'm thinking of it with my physical therapy hat on. I feel that sometimes um, we don't update their treatment, and I know this was a problem right from the beginning. 
sometimes I didn't even know that the patient had a test until the patient says, hey, I'm going to the doctor. Can I get a copy of that test? And then I start thinking to myself, well, if we don't know as the therapist treating that patient that they had a test, we obviously are not updating their treatment plan. And that's where the PTs will understand. So my question to you was, do you think the best fix for that is that neurofascial course? Right at this moment, look, I'm going to be very tender front with you, okay? Right now, the two things that we have is the clinical utility for diagnostic testing, and we have the neurofascial course through hands-on symptoms. Right now, there is nothing else right, 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 right in the order, okay? To be able to cook completely and be able to say, okay, here it is, take it. Plus, there is, for the people in the States that they do dry needling, it is the Bill Dodson's dry needling course where he teaches how to do dry needling under musculoskeletal ultrasound. Okay, so these are pretty much what we have right now. I do see the need, I do see the need for some more correlations between diagnostic utility and treatment. I do see that, okay? I, I saw that even, I observed that even last week, a little bit more after a couple of conversations that I had with a couple of owners like you. So, you know, give me a little time, it, it, it's processing, okay? <laughs> Sometimes it takes me a little, a little process to, a little time to process things and come up with uh, uh, more ideas on this, okay? Um, so I said, uh, no, Cindy, it's, so your passion course, the clinical utility of diagnostic testing, which is a 35 online video available to you, and the third one for states that they do dry needling is the Bill Dodson um, uh, dry needling course under musculoskeletal ultrasound. This is what we have right now. Um, then, uh, Janine McClellan, uh, Janine, I never said that you need two separate NTI now. No, maybe if I mention, if I said it, that's the wrong statement. You need two separate tax ID numbers. Okay, tax ID numbers. NPI number is one NPI number for you. It is like, it is an NPI number is like like your social, your personal social security number for health. So you don't get, I don't think you can get a separate NPI number as an individual. Your NPI number is your NPI number. It's where you link it to. You link it to two different companies, one let's say that is in network, one that is out of network, or you link it in one that is uh, on feed company, the other one uh, uh, just does only diagnostics. Any other questions? It is the same NPI, Lisa, it is the same NPI number. Well, you, okay. you, get an, you get an individual NPI number, and then as a company, as an entity, you can get an NPI number for the entity. So when you have three different entities, you will have three different NPI numbers, one for each entity. So hands-on physical therapy has an NPI number, and hands-on EMG testing is a separate NPI number as a company. The knee, as Demetrios, I have an NPI number, and my NPI number is linked to the one company and linked to the other company. Hey, Demi. Yeah, Lisa. No, no, that's what I was trying to uh, answer to Janine. I got an MPI for each company. Your for the PTs, you don't get different MPIs, but per company, because you do need an MPI for the second company to bill at a network. Okay, Janine, you got it. Janine says she got it. Okay. All right, cool. Um, all right. Um, I want to remind all of you that you must uh, keep the September 21, 22, and 23 
September 21, 22, and 23 is, uh, I'm sorry, I repeat again, September 20, 21, and 22, September 20, 21, and 22, keep those dates open as that is going to be our annual symposium, that's September 20 to 22. Now, just to give you an idea what is happening with that, it's going to happen in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we're looking for to finalize the establishment that this will happen. Um, so on, on September 21, we are going to do the owner's forum. So this will be the day only for the owners. Okay, and then September, look at this, I'm sorry, I keep writing the wrong stuff. September 20th is the owner's forum, and 21 and 22 is the symposium. Okay, this is the correct information now, what you see. Okay. So, September 20th is a Friday. What we are planning to do that Friday is start in the morning, run the owner's forum, which is going to be pretty freaking amazing. Uh, and then in the evening, we're going to run, we're going to do like a little gathering and cocktail. Um, uh, and uh, at that time, your staff can arrive for the symposium which will start next morning, so they can participate in that gathering, figure out what gathering will happen around something maybe 7 o'clock or something like that in the evening, okay? And then the uh, 21st and 22nd, we're going to get the symposium. The symposium, you know, is going to run the first day somewhere around uh, 8.30 or so until about 5.30, and then that Saturday night, on the 21st, we're going to have the awards um, uh, dinner, uh, and then on the 22nd, we're going to start again in the morning, and we're going to finish uh, in the afternoon, maybe 2 or 3 o'clock, so you guys can get back home. Um, okay, uh, and uh, that, that the, the, the symposium will be pretty amazing. Also, uh, parallel to the symposium, like we did last year, on September 21 and 22, we are going to start, we are going to offer also the HADS Forum. And the HADS Forum is for people of the HADS Summit. And the HADS Summit is for people who are not yet with HADS. So that would be your opportunity to bring in and invite uh, colleagues, associates that you think would be a good fit for cards. We're going to run that event parallel to the support. Uh, a question that uh, Roy is asking me, uh, you have two options, Roy, a technician um, or a PTA who gets trained in the program counts for half of a spot that you have. Or if you do not, so in other words, you can train two technicians, and that will take one position of the five that you have. Uh, if you don't want that to happen, there is a fee schedule that you can pay um, separately for each technician you want to train, so you don't utilize any of your five spots. But the technician is uh, counting towards uh, one spot. Let me see. Lisa, you want to ask something? Lisa, did you have a question? No, no, I answered it before. What do you mean? Okay, good. All right. Any other questions by anyone? Okay. Uh, also, um, I want to 
tell you, you saw that Nathan Shields announced the CAS mastermind group. This is a network that we fully support. Um, and, uh, you know, just a reply to him if you guys are interested in being part of the mastermind group. And uh, um, we have to fully support it. Um, I will be, uh, Nathan will be in charge of the group. I will be helping as an outside person of the group. I'm not going to be directly involved within the group, but I will be helping the group um, as an outside person. But I have fully supporting the group. Um, we are also in the process of um, creating an advocacy group because we can realize that although uh, our association is helping and helping tremendously and we should be members of the APTA and the ACE WM, the Academy of Clinical Electrophysiology and Good Management. It only costs $50 to be a member of this, okay, after you get the rate of membership. It helps tremendously for you to be part of this. But here is the problem. Although these organizations can help legislatively and they can help us with the price and everything, they can help financial plans, unfortunately. So we are planning to create a advocacy group, which advocacy group will have a legal fund, okay? Uh, again, I personally will not be part of the board of this group. I will be advised, an advisor to the group, I will be consulting the group, but it will be a board that will include Hats, members, uh, and even it can include the non hats uh, members. But we are going to do a lot of fundraising and be able to use the funds collected for any possible legal challenges and help our members around the country when they want to achieve something to get a financial backup to be able to achieve. Um, I, I know that uh, has, once this group will be fully created, HAG is going to do an initial significant donation to the legal fund of this group. But then, uh, you know, we'll fundraise it so that we can uh, get a nice chunk of money that that group can decide how to, uh, to, to use it to create positive impact around the country uh, for our profession. So let me think if I have anything else major to announce. Hmm. Zoom, get everybody to go and register on Zoom. So this coming Wednesday, you're not going to be a go to meeting, it's not going to work. Go to webinar, it's not going to work. You need to register on Zoom to be able to get into Wednesday's meeting. So, Zoom is what we're going to be using from now on. Much better technology, much more robust, requires less uh, wave band, um, and um, uh, we're going to be using that technology moving forward. Like for example, right now, if we were using Zoom, I would be able to see all of you with no problem on meetings with Zoom meetings. Uh, you can put up there, I think, up to 300 people with their webcams. It's, it's amazing what you can do with that program. So. Any questions about anyone? If you find this training helpful, oh, higher box. 
Okay, what I'm gonna do, yes, what I'm gonna do is I will uh, send you, I will send you the link for the Kaya box, but also what I'm gonna do is I am going to send an email to the owner, Patrick, that any one of you who reaches to him that he extends um, the discount. Okay, I've got the discount that the has member, so it's part of the organization, so he will extend the discount. Uh, Demi? Yes, Bill. Um, so, um, um, you know, we talked about, uh, and this is just a kind of reminder, I'm going to send you this email here today. Um, I was going to start a library for the ENMG. And so I'm sending you an email. You would mark an email right now. And it'll give the it'll give, oh I'm doing MSK too huh <laughs> okay I'll do that I'll do that so um, what I was thinking was uh, um, I'm gonna send you the email and see if you and Mark have any issues with it and then I would really like to send a, a mass email to everybody and just you know get something started and. And I really feel like that there's a there's a really easy way to get this organized. So I just want to let you know I didn't forget about it, and um, I'm moving in on it right now. That's awesome. Uh, so so uh, you'll get more information, guys, on this. Um, but uh, uh, Bill is he's going to be in charge of creating a library. Uh, or EMG and ultrasound, um, you know, I get a ton of materials that I can get from that library. We can house it, we can house it both on Dropbox, we can house it even on a separate um, a website if we want. Uh, so it would be really, really uh, great uh, if you. Uh, up on this uh, bill and we create it can make a great impact uh, to the whole organization really I think uh, and indexing it appropriately right creating it some some uh, proper yeah. uh, index uh, okay yeah, it'll, be, it'll be it'll be kind of like a search engine in a way but um, so if somebody's looking at um, you know uh, just ridiculopathy in the upper extremity you know they'll have you know, maybe, and then they'll be able to go even further uh, into the, because we'll have a little bit of a description, a full description of that, of that study, and they'll be able to go in and, and uh, or if they have, um, um, uh, you know, only lower extremity peripheral neuropathy issues, and things like that. That's awesome. That's, that's, that's very, very good. Um, also, uh, let me ask you a few questions. Um, just send me a quick, uh, a quick, uh, uh, just to the group right now, a quick uh, uh, note if you are interested to get information on how you can bring in your practice, the Neuropasha Review course. Uh, I got here from Mindy, Mindy is going to get to send you information on that. If, if there is any, Anybody uh, else? Who, uh, Janine? Uh, if, if there's anybody else, please let me know. And also, uh, those of you who are in stage who are doing right me, please send me uh, a thing uh, that uh, uh, indicates that you are interested to have a field box on Brian Weekly and we'll send you information for that too. So I have here from Europasho, Nindi, Janine, and Roy, and Cindy. All right. And let us know if anybody is interested on the grinding group course too. But you have to be in a state uh, uh, that, uh, that you can do grinding, okay? I'll see if you didn't sign up for anything, you can just uh, ask information for 
the new fashion course. All right. So anything else you guys want, you can just uh, email to me privately. Um, I hope we had uh, uh, a good time yesterday and today. Uh, I'll make sure to make the recording of yesterday and today available to you. Um, and I hope the recording will be able to watch it beyond Wednesday, after Wednesday also. Uh, but uh, I don't know um, what's happening because Wednesday uh, we're supposed to cancel it. I said Monday, but we're going to do Wednesday for two days extra. We're supposed to be canceling both webinars on Wednesday. Um, okay. That's, uh, oh, you're welcome, Grant. You're welcome. That's awesome. Okay, I hope you had a good time and uh, yeah, the rest of your um, your afternoon, the rest of your day, uh, enjoy it. I don't know if you're doing any uh, St. Patrick's Parade in uh, your uh, uh, town here in New York, they did it yesterday. Uh, but, um, you know, happy St. Patrick's Day too. <laughs> Okay, guys, I thank you for your support. Bye -bye. Thank you a lot, Jimmy. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. Appreciate you. Yep. Thank you, Thanks, Jimmy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.